Good evening. good evening, and good evening to those of you joining us online. As we prepare our hearts for tonight's worship, let us begin by sharing in and with one another the peace of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us share with one another God's peace. We should glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, for he is our salvation, our life, and our resurrection. Through him we are saved and made free. The Prayers of the People In the company of Jesus, and in unity with his faithful followers in years past, and in our present day, let us offer our prayers responding Kyrie eleison. For the gift of humility, that we may mirror the servanthood of Jesus, bending the knee of our hearts to all those whose feet have journeyed a long distance and whose hands have washed away the burdens of others, let us pray. For peace throughout the world, especially in the Ukraine, between nations and peoples who struggle to see you in one another, and in all places where the lust for power fosters tyranny, war, and oppression, let us pray. For the courage to face our own unfaithfulness, the kisses of deception, the subtle betrayals, our spiritual sleepiness, that in turning to Christ, we may receive the grace that changes lives. Let us pray. For those who keep watch this night, that in watching they may be found, in seeking they may be filled with the Spirit, and in waiting they may find peace. Let us pray. For those who keep watch every night, the hungry, the homeless, the fearful, that Christ may in them be their own, in their own gardens, may find them in their own gardens of Gethsemane and not leave them in despair. Let us pray. In thanksgiving for this Eucharistic meal, which gathers us into the fellowship of all the beloved, uniting us with Jesus, whose divine presence we now share. Let us pray. In companionship with Peter, John, and all the apostles, we lift up, lift up those in need, who need to know the healing and the strengthening power of your love, especially those we name silently or out loud. Let your spirit rest upon them, giving them an assurance that they do not walk alone. Let us pray.
almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God calls us in our lives to be like the grain of wheat which dies, which lets go of one form in order to be transformed into new and fuller life. And yet we often fear the risk and change which new growth involves. Let us ponder for a moment the places where we may be resisting God moving in our lives. When we resist your call to change our hearts and allow deepening of relationship, Lord, have mercy. When we nurse our wounded hearts and withhold forgiveness, which may transform relationships, Christ, have mercy. When fear for our own security leads us to close our hearts from those who are in need, Lord, have mercy. By faith, we know one who makes a covenant in our hearts is faithful and forgives us our sins and failures. In Christ, God offers all forgiving grace and welcome into a community of trust, abundance, and hope. We give thanks that God's grace and mercy comes to us, not in accordance with what we deserve, but out of God's love for us. Amen. You may be seated. The Upper Room. It was just before the Passover, and I thought Jesus would stay back in Bethany for the feast, but he insisted that we return to Jerusalem. Go into the city, he said. A friend of mine will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. As Peter and I rounded a corner, coming out of a narrow alley, was a man we didn't know, but he looked at us as if we were expected. He gave us a key and told us to help ourselves, so we made preparation for the Seder meal. Peter went to the market to get the herbs, matzah, and the wine, herbs to remind us of the bitter slavery of our ancestors in Egypt, matzah bread not given time to rise as our forefathers hurried away from their chains, and wine, red wine, like the blood of the little lambs that marked the door frames of the Exodus like the blood placed on the altar, reminding us that freedom is not without sacrifice. It was the same meal as every other meal of our lives, with my parents and grandparents, and for these last few years with Jesus, I roasted the lamb myself, but this time, Peter is no good at such things. He barely got all that was needed from the market. He was too busy arguing over the price of oil with the merchants to pay attention to his list. Jesus and the rest of the brothers arrived right on time for a change. The sun was setting as they came through the door, and the smell of the fresh spring evening was only outdone by the smell of the lamb on the fire, if I do say so myself. Everyone was their rowdy, regular selves. Simon was arguing politics with Nathaniel. Thomas was on some philosophical rant about what can be known or not known. Judas was dark and brooding, maybe more than usual, come to think about it. James came over to sniff the lamb, convinced I had ruined it. He took a taste and gave me a smile, the same proud smile he flashed when we were kids. And he tussled my hair like the time I had finally mastered the throwing of the net from the bow of our father's boat. And Jesus was uncharacteristically solemn. Oh, that mysterious dancing light was in his eyes, to be sure. But he seemed so burdened. Please stand and join us in singing What Did He Know? Found on page five of your bulletin.
When we gathered around the table to eat, I understood why. He began with a kiddish, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all the nations and gave us with love, Sabbaths for rest, festivals for happiness, holidays for joy, and this day of Passover for our freedom. He stopped and I thought he would cry. Then he spoke, barely a whisper. I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. The entire table went to pieces, as you might imagine, and Jesus did little to explain or comfort us until he took a slab of bread in his hand. He broke it into pieces and handed it to us and said, this is my body, give for you, eat it and remember me. The bread was still stuck in my throat and questions in my mind when he raised the cup and said much the same. This is my blood, which is poured out for many. Drink it and remember me. The red wine, like the blood of the little lambs that marked the door of the Exodus, the blood placed on the altar, reminding us that freedom is not without sacrifice. For the longest time, we just sat around staring at each other, confused. The munching of bread and our own pounding pulses were the only sounds that filled our ears. Finally, Jesus broke the silence, cutting the tension as he began singing, Ol Shana Haba Abe, Yeshualan, next year in Jerusalem. We all joined in the singing, though none of us knew at the time that for Jesus, there wouldn't be another year in Jerusalem. There wouldn't be another day. And for the rest of us, no day or year would ever be the same again. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, 
and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took out his auto robe, and tied a towel around him. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but my, whole, my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and he returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right. That is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash the feet of one another. For I have set you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are the messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now, the Son of Man is glorified. And God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. <laughs> Today is Monday, Thursday, and we begin to journey the first of a three-part service called Triduum, a service that tells the story of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus made on our behalf, and that also celebrates the immensity of God's love, love that clears the way for us to know eternal joy. Joy that we don't deserve, but are offered simply because of who we are, God's beloved. In my medieval liturgics class, I learned that at one time, all three services, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter, along with the vigil there in the middle, were celebrated as a whole from start to to finish. For three days, people would come together in community to hear the story and witness a reenactment 
of the Lord's betrayal, death, and ultimate resurrection. After sunset on the first day, which in Jewish tradition is the beginning of that day, their focus is on hearing how Jesus prepared his disciples for what was about to happen. They ate, they listened, their feet were washed, and then they prayed. Prayed for the strength, as did Jesus, for what lay ahead. Throughout the night, the choir would sing psalms. The Old Testament promises would be recited over and over, and there would be silence. Lots of silence. Like the disciples in the garden, in the silence, some would grow weary and fall asleep while others remembering Jesus' question to the disciples, can you not stay awake with me for one hour? Would in turn keep watch throughout the night. And then somewhere in the middle of the night, there'd be this motion. And the person who was playing the role of Jesus would be arrested and thrown into a dungeon, later facing the chief priest and members of Sanhedrin. By sunset, the beginning of day two, Jesus will have been convicted, crucified, and placed in the tomb. In modern times, we no longer spend three days in church. Sadly, many avoid the harshness of Holy Week altogether, choosing to jump instead from Palm Sunday right to the Easter morning. I get it. Hearing about that triumphant Jesus, be it his glorious entry into Jerusalem or his emergence from the tomb, is much more desirable than hearing the events that transpires in between. But throughout the entirety of the story Triduum tells, the good news of the resurrection is actually incomplete. While the resurrection demonstrates the power and faithfulness of God's love, what is missed by those who make that jump from Palm Sunday to Easter, something those here come to witness, is the outward demonstration of the depth of God's love for us. That which gives the resurrection its meaning. Tonight, during the first set of readings, we were reminded that on this night, as Jesus prepared himself for what was to happen during what we call the Last Supper, he first prepared and offered assurance to those closest to him. But when he says that he is a servant and not the master, he gets the deer in a headlight look. And then he does something even more amazing. He washes their feet. There is this sense the disciples just don't get it. How can the master be the servant? Jesus tells them it has nothing to do with such a relationship. At the center of service is not one's power or position, but love. Love willing to do for the other just because of who they are. He then tells his disciples, they are to love one another just as he has loved them. Jesus goes on to tell them much more, describing what real love looks like and, and what it is capable of, assuring them that God's love for them is something they can rely on because it is as real as he is, standing right in front of them. Only later will the disciples understand that what Jesus is talking about is not washing the feet as an act of love or service, 
but describing the sacrificial nature of the cross. And not just the cross he will hang upon, but the cross they and we will bear, sharing what has been shared with them, with us. Love so great that it has the power to overcome any obstacle we face, even death itself. Following the meal, he shares with his disciple, disciples, the meal, he says, will be the reminder of the love he shares with those who receive it. He leads the disciples to Gethsemane, where he invites them to pray with him for strength. Strength they will all need to weather the coming storm. Like the disciples, tonight we are invited to pray with Jesus as the events of the Triduum unfold before us. We may not be able to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, but we can sit in our own garden right here. In our chapel across from the office, the altar guild has put together a garden of our own. And on the altar tonight will be the bread and the wine we will use in tomorrow's services. That which Jesus said to his disciples at dinner would be the physical representation of his spiritual presence. Throughout the night, we are invited, as were the disciples, to sit and pray with Jesus for the strength we need to face the challenges before us. The good news is, even though it may seem like the journey we are on takes us through the darkest of times, we know, we know how that story ends. And that our faith in God and God's promises will carry us as it did Jesus through it all. I encourage you to set aside one hour this night, offering your prayers of petition and thanksgiving before the altar of repose, entering tonight through the blue door on Thomas Drive. While we would like to provide continuous and prayerful presence here in the chapel, you may pray from wherever you are for however long you can. Then if you're able, tomorrow come and join us in person at noon or our 6.30 service in person or online to hear and witness the story of love. Love willing to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves simply because of who we are. God's beloved.
From the gifts we have been given, we give you to be our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. God of our Father, we are gathered here to share in the supper which your only son left to his church to reveal his love. He gave it to us when he was about to die and commanded us to celebrate it as the new and eternal sacrifice. We pray that in this Eucharist we may find the fullness of love and life it offers to all. And mercifully grant that we may receive it thankfully in remembrance of Jesus Christ our Lord, who in these holy mysteries gives us a pledge of eternal life. And so we offer to you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of Christ. On the night before he died, for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it. And he gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you eat it, do this in remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. We now celebrate, O Lord, the memorial of Christ our Savior. By means of this holy bread and cup, we show forth the sacrifice of Christ's death and proclaim the resurrection until Christ comes in glory. Gather us by this holy communion into one body in the risen Lord and make us a living sacrifice of praise through Christ and with Christ and in Christ in the glory of the Holy Spirit. To you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and be thankful.
Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Heavenly Father, whose church on earth is to be a sign of your heavenly peace, an image of the new and eternal Jerusalem, grant to us in the days of our pilgrimage that feel spiritually with the, fed spiritually with the living bread of heaven and washed clean by the blood of our Lord shed for us, we may be the temple of your presence the place of your glory on earth, and a sign to, of all, to all of your peace in the world. Strengthen us, Lord, to be the witnesses you have called us to be, to the hope shared in and through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Gethsemane. We followed Jesus from the upper room to Gethsemane. It wasn't far, a mile or so. It would have been closer had we crossed the temple grounds, but Jesus seemed to want nothing more to do with the temple. So we twisted our way through the upper city, an alley here, a sidewalk there, until we made our way into that blessed olive grove. The rabbis say the trees in Gethsemane are as old as Abraham. I don't know. How could anything be that ancient? I do know that Jesus loved that place. We went there often to pray, to listen to his stories, to get away from the crowds. On that night, that dark Thursday night, Gethsemane smelled grassy, like summer, though only the blooms were first budding in the, on the old trees. The men settled in a comfortable spot while Peter, my little brother John, and myself pressed deeper into the canopy with Jesus. He was driven on this night, as serious as I have ever seen him. He turned to me once and said, James, my soul is drowning in grief. Please, please pray for me and keep watch. But keep watch for what, I thought. There was so much I didn't understand. Finally, he pulled further away from us and seemed to collapse at the trunk of one of those old primordial trees, his body twisting like its branches in agony. I tell you, I was terrified for him.
Stronger than my confusion and fear was my exhaustion. Peter and little John fell fast asleep as soon as we knelt to pray. I can't blame them. They had wakened early, gone ahead to Jerusalem, and prepared the Passover meal for the rest of us. So I know they were tired. I finally dozed off myself. All that red wine, the heavy conversation, the night as thick and dark as the grave. What can I say? I fell asleep. Jesus came and gave us all a swift kick where we napped. Could you not keep watch just for the one hour? He asked. There was such pain in his voice, stronger than disappointment. The man was desperate. He returned to his prayers, and all, I could hear him speak of God's will and suffering and betrayal. It caused me to return to his words from the dinner table. One of you will betray me. Who? Not we three. Not Andrew. He was the most thoughtful man of the bunch. Philip? Of course not. Matthew? Maybe. He did work for the Romans for a season, but he seemed ha so happy to be free of them now. Then it struck me. Where was Judas? He had been in the upper room. I was sure of it. He sat right there at Jesus' side, but I couldn't remember him on our walk to the garden. Was he in the back of the line? Had he lost his way in the dark? Maybe he paused to count the coins, as he was so prone to do. It was then that I heard his voice in the distance. This way, just a bit further, almost there, he was saying. And there were other voices, many voices. As I turned to wake Peter and John, there Jesus stood, his sorrow now replaced with a steely determination that was as frightening to me as my confusion had been. Judas arrived leading a company of angry men. They had arrest warrants stamped with the seal of the high priest. They were armed with swords, spears, and torches, dressed as a conquering army going to battle. We huddled behind Jesus like frightened sheep, waiting for him to strike them down. Jesus stepped forward, his face illuminated by a flickering torch, and the suspense only heightened. Rabbi, he said, and he kissed Jesus on the cheek. Jesus, with a haunting, knowing gaze, fixed Judas in his sights, and with a look of pity or compassion or distress, said gently, my friend, do what you must do. Chaos descended. Those men fell on Jesus like predators on prey. All the disciples scattered like spooked birds, and yes, I ran. I ran as hard as these old legs could carry me all the way back to Bethany. I didn't know what happened until morning, but by morning, it was too late.
Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. 